about understanding and improving health, the lessons that we can take with us from Central Appalachia, things that apply here in this region. Uh, the t subtitle of my talk is How High is the Wall in Your Town? And hopefully by the time this talk is done, you'll have a sense of why we chose that subtitle. For those of you who have seen this talk before, I apologize. I will tell you that all the data have been updated, so it's all new. I've made up entirely new stuff for today. I've had the opportunity in the last couple of, like a year and a half or so, to speak on this topic in different places around the country. I've spoken up in Wisconsin, Washington, D.C., recently in Georgia, and I've come to realize that people have very different understandings of what's meant by the term Appalachia. So I'm going to take just a moment to talk to you about it as well. Obviously, those of you who are hikers know the Appalachian Trail runs from Maine to Georgia, but the Appalachian Regional Commission says we run from southwest New York to northeast Mississippi, about 420 counties and 13 states, all of West Virginia and part of 12 other states, including, of course, Tennessee and Virginia. Population about 25 million, about 8% of the U.S. population. Overall, Appalachia, of course, is much more likely to be poor and much more likely to be rural than the rest of the country. But when many people think of Appalachia, they don't think of the entirety of, of the region. They think more of central Appalachia, the 238 counties of the Appalachian part of Tennessee, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, w uh, North Carolina, and West Virginia, and part of Ohio. Again, if you look at this map, that's the region right there that most people tend to think of when they think of Appalachia. Less than half of all the people who live in Appalachia live in the 238 counties that we would call central Appalachia, but even more likely to be poor and uh, un unemployed. So here, and on all these maps, I'm going to show you real quickly the... Uh, I don't know. My pointer has stopped working. Um, that's okay. The, the dark counties are worse, so progressively you'll see that the, uh, unemployment is clustered here in central Appalachia. If you look at high school non-completion, you can see it's clustered here in central Appalachia. If you look at children living in poverty, you can see it's clustered here in central Appalachia. And if you want to look at distressed and at-risk counties, again, it's clustered here in central Appalachia. So we face a number of significant health challenges. Indeed, when most people think of Appalachia, they tend to think of uh, the traditional view of, of, of Appalachia, of course, is people living in very difficult conditions, working very hard to make ends meet. Now, this perception of Appalachia has changed, of course, in the modern era of mass media. And I used to think that perceptions didn't matter until a TV show called Moonshiners came on TV. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's now in its fourth season or so. But the, the reason, it, and in fact, it begins with this tagline in central Appalachia, moonshine is considered by many to be a way of life. Right? You all heard that. I was giving a talk on central Appalachia up in Washington, D.C., and I asked them, how would you like it if there was a TV show that said, in Washington, D.C., dealing heroin is considered by many to be a way of life? I'm sorry? Oh, they didn't think that was particularly funny, but anyway, neither did you all, I, I take it. So. so the reason this is important is that and this is uh, Tim and Tickle. In the first season, they were the two guys that were involved. Tim was a moonshiner, and Tickle was his still hand, and so on. And the reason perceptions become important is about halfway through the first season, there was an episode where they went outside. Uh, and there's the truck that they used to haul the moonshine right there. Uh, here was uh, Tickle with his high-powered automatic rifle, chain-smoking cigarettes. And that's not a particularly good healthy image to project of Appalachia. But what should happen is... Tim's son came into the picture, and you might question the propriety of having a minor on a TV show about an illegal activity, but to make it more interesting, uh, his son was wearing an East Tennessee State University t-shirt. <laughs> now, every other logo on this show they've blurred out. For some reason, they didn't see a need for that. We're expecting to see a major increase in enrollment. And I'm, I'm going to propose a new tagline higher education helps you shine. <laughs> Sorry about that. But it does become important because you realize that perceptions do matter. If not to other people, they matter to ourselves. And they matter to our children. 
So I want to propose a different perception of Appalachia, and that's a region of incredible natural beauty and deep and rich culture and heritage, and a reg region that has faced some very significant health challenges, but is addressing them very effectively. Okay, so that's the perception. If, if I was going to show you just one slide to document the difficult health challenges that we face in central Appalachia, it would be this one. In 2008, the Gallup Healthway Organization ranked all 435 congressional districts in the country for physical health, among other things. The, count, the congressional districts in red are in the bottom quintile, the bottom fifth. All right? The four worst congressional districts in the country in 2008 were Tennessee's first congressional district, where we're all sitting right now, Virginia's ninth congressional district, where some of you are from, West Virginia's third congressional district, and Kentucky's fifth congressional district. The worst physical health in the country in 2008, according to this report, was right here. So when I go around, people often ask about the health status of central Appalachia, particularly asking two specific questions, which is what and what. What is the health status of central Appalachia? And more importantly, what can be done about it? Those are really the questions that folks want to ask. Now, what I've learned talking in Wisconsin and Georgia and other places is that people are not particularly interested in the statistics of central Appalachia. They're more interested in the lessons learned. So for statistical purposes for today, I'm not going to talk about all 238 counties. I'm going to talk about just the eight counties of northeast Tennessee and the nine counties and two towns of southwest Virginia. Specifically, this is the region that I'll be talking about. So all the slides I'm going to show you now are directly relevant to the areas that most of you all work. Now, to understand the health status of our region, we need to take a step back and talk about the health status of the country first. Because obviously you need to know the context in which any region, whether it's this region or southwest Virginia, or the U.S.-Mexico border health region or anywhere else. All right. And of course, the health status of the United States is generally defined by life expectancy. When we talk in public health about the health of a country, we usually use life expectancy. It is, of course, the most basic fundamental measure of health. It's how long a baby born today is projected to live. Right? If you think about it, everything that goes into a person's life is reflected in life expectancy. How old is mom when she gets pregnant? Does mom use nicotine or alcohol or other addictive substances during pregnancy? Is that baby born in a safe environment? Is that child kept warm the first critical hours of life? Does that child have clean water and abundant food? Do they grow up in a country free from war and famine and civil strife? Do they live at a time where there aren't epidemic diseases? Can they get a job? Can they get an education? If they get ill or injured, can they get access to health care? All of that times 310 million is life expectancy in the United States. It's the most basic fundamental measure of health. And if we went out on the streets of Kingsport today and we asked the man on the street to tell us something about life expectancy, first thing he would tell us is that life expectancy in the United States is probably the longest today that it's ever been. And the man on the street would be right. In 2012, life expectancy in our country is about 78 and a half years. And it's the longest it has ever been. If you look at this map from 1900 to 2000 in the last century, life expectancy in our country went up by 30 years. Now think about that for a second. From the time my grandparents were born to the time my youngest child was born, life expectancy went up by 30 years. That's really a remarkable accomplishment. The second thing the man on the street will likely tell us about life expectancy in the United States is that it is probably the longest in the world. The man on the street knows that we are one of the wealthiest countries that has ever existed. We have a healthcare infrastructure unlike that anywhere in the world. We train our healthcare professionals uh, in a way that's the envy of many countries in the world. But here the man on the street would be wrong. And in 2012, the U.S. ranks behind all of these countries and ranks 33rd in the world. Two and a half dozen countries that do better at this most basic fundamental measure of health than our country does. Two and a half dozen countries where a baby born today is projected to live a longer life than a baby born in the United States. And if that doesn't worry you, here are all 50 states for life expectancy from Hawaii at the top to Mississippi at the bottom, and there you'll see Tennessee 44th. So here we are in a state that ranks 44th in the nation that ranks 33rd in the world. Now some of you may look at this and say, yeah, but Virginia's up there, we're above average, so we're doing okay. But of course you all know that Virginia is Virginia, 
Southwest Virginia is Southwest Virginia, and only 4% of the population of Virginia lives in Southwest Virginia. Only 8% of the population of Tennessee lives in Northeast Tennessee. So if we're really going to understand the health status of our region, we've got to look at those counties and not the entire state. And what we've started doing now is we've taken the uh, data for the nation. I'm gonna, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you data for all 3,141 counties in America and then I'll compare our region to those counties. Okay, does that make sense? And in America, there's a little over 3,000 counties and county equivalents. In Louisiana, we had parishes and things like that, but basically 3,141 distinct political units. And what I'm gonna do is look at the premature mortality, years of potential life loss. Don't worry about how the number is calculated, but what it is, is the, if you die before the age of 75, Every year you die young, so if you die at 65, that's 10 years of potential life lost. Per 100,000 population, what's remarkable about it is it goes from a low of 3,900 3, to a high of 24,000. But again, don't worry too much about the numbers. The median nationally is about 7,726. Now what I'm going to do, because of the, the way this chart works, you know, we have these outliers here and here. So I'm going to drop off the bottom and top 10%, okay? So now you're looking at 80% of the counties in America, the 10th to the 90th for premature mortality. Does that make sense to folks? All right. Now I'm just going to adjust the scale on the right. This is still the same data. 77 is still the median. Okay. Now I'm going to put the counties of Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia onto this map. Here are the eight counties of Northeast Tennessee, and here are the 11 counties and cities in Southwest Virginia. 100% of them fall in the bottom half of the nation. Two-thirds of them fall into the bottom quarter, and most of them are below the Tennessee average. So here we are in a region that is worse than the 44th state in the 33rd country in the world. All right. Now I started by posing two what questions. Most of you are now asking a different question, which is why. Why should someone in our region be more likely to live a shorter life than people born in other states and in dozens of other countries. Why do we have health statistics in our region that are so much worse than we could achieve? And we know we could achieve them because other places have. Why do we have health statistics, whether we define it as Central Appalachia or Northeast Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, why do we have health statistics that are so much less than we could achieve? Well, we can answer that question, but again, we have to take a step back and look at the health status of the U.S. All right, and then we'll learn from that. So there was an article in the New England Journal in 2007 that laid out the five things that cause us to die young in America. Not the five causes of death, right? Two-thirds of Americans will die from heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or unintentional injury. Right? Two-thirds of us in this room, barring progression of the Ebola outbreak or something else, will die of heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or unintentional injury. Right? But this is what are the factors that cause us to get those conditions? That's a different kind of question. What are the factors that cause us to die young, premature death? Well, a third of it's due to genetics, what we inherit from our family. Where we end up is based in part on where we start, just like life. 5% uh, due to environmental exposures, a small portion due to social circumstance. This leaves two wedges in the pie. And people are often surprised to learn that the smaller wedge is health care. What this says is that if all Americans had access to the very best health care, which they do not, we would reduce our premature death rate by about 10%. You'll see other reports that put this up as high as 20%, but it's still the minority. Okay? Now, that's not to say that access to health care isn't important. It is vitally important. And whatever we would want for ourselves and our families, we should want for the people around us. But what we're saying is that if all Americans had access to the very best health care, we would reduce premature death by about 10%. So obviously this big wedge in the pie is our behaviors, right? 40% of our early death is caused by things we do to ourselves. Now this is national. It's reasonable to ask the question, okay, based on this, what do we know about our region? Which of these factors is causing us to die young in this region? So the first one to ask about is genetics. You might think, well, that's kind of ridiculous. It's not going to be anything genetic. Well, there's at least one plausible reason. 
If you look at the distribution, for example, of Scots-Irish in America, you'll see a clustering right here in central Appalachia. Maybe there's something about us being Scots-Irish that causes us to die young. There's no evidence to support that. In fact, there's a good piece of evidence uh, to counter-argue that, and that is uh, based uh, on this woman, Bess Brown Cooper. I don't know how many of you know her. She was born right here in Sullivan County, not directly here, but she may have been, I don't know, but here in Sullivan County in 1896. She graduated from East Tennessee State University in 1916. She was our oldest living alum for a number of years because we, for almost two years, she was the world's oldest living person. Not the oldest person from Tennessee, not the oldest person who graduated from ETSU, not the oldest person from Sullivan County, the world's oldest person, and one of only eight people to reach the age of 116, which proves absolutely nothing except to suggest that maybe genetics isn't the reason that we're dying young in our region. We have the potential to, to get beyond where we are. Well, maybe the reason is you guys. Maybe we just have really bad health care in this region. How do I get out of here? Right. Well, every year the county health rankings rank all 95 counties in Tennessee. In fact, much, most of the data I'm showing you is from something called the county health rankings, which has combined all 50 states. And every year they rank all 95 counties in Tennessee. And one of the areas they rank them in is clinical care. We do have health manpower shortage areas here. I'm not. So clinical care. Well, how do our region look for clinical care in the state of Tennessee for all 95 counties? Here are the top five counties in Tennessee including two right here in this region. All right. So w the truth is what you guys are doing is actually really good and it's ranking you in the very top statewide. Again, you can argue that there are plenty of folks in this region who can't get access to health care and so on, but the quality of the care as measured independently by the county health rankings is in fact good in this region. So then the question comes up, maybe it's these behavioral factors. Maybe there's something about our behaviors in this region that are worse than they are in other places and are causing us to die young. We know what these behaviors are, the Centers for Disease Control reports on the factors that cause us to die young. And no surprise to any of you, the number one factor is nicotine addiction, tobacco use, followed by diet and activity, uh, being overweight, the obesity epidemic, if you will. The numbers drop off fairly quickly here, but alcohol, 3.5%. Infectious diseases, 100 years ago, the leading cause of death, now just 3% of deaths. Toxic agents, secondhand smoke and pollutants and so on, 2.3. Motor vehicles, self-explanatory. Firearms, self-explanatory. Sexual behaviors that leads to diseases like AIDS and other conditions and illicit drug use. These are the things the Centers for Disease Control says we're dying from nationally. Well, how does our region compare? I'm not going to go through all of them, just the first two. For tobacco, here's all 3,000 counties in America, except without the top 10% and bottom 10%. Pretty remarkable if you think about it, there's a doubling. Think about it, that's, that's, that's a pretty remarkable disparity on something that's an entirely voluntary activity. All right. Where do our counties fit on this? Here are the counties of Northeast Tennessee, here are the counties of Southwest Virginia, there are two counties for which there are no data. 100% are at or worse than the national rate, two thirds fall in the bottom quarter, and most of them are even worse than Tennessee as a whole. So clearly if we're looking for a behavioral factor that's causing us to die young, nicotine addiction, tobacco use is clearly one of those issues. Diet and activity, obesity, uh, again another area where nationally we have this phenomenal disparity. Um, if you think, again, think about, if you just go home tonight and think about these disparities on this slide, it's pretty remarkable. You know, this, the tenth, the tenth, oops, the tenth lowest rate in the country is 25 percent, the Tenth highest is 35 percent. Interestingly, our region is not as bad as you might think. We're definitely worse than the national rate, uh, but not significantly so. Okay, and in fact, we're maybe look a little bit better than the state of Tennessee as a whole. Now, I, I know what's going to happen. The headlines are going to say, "Dean of Public Health says obesity not problem in Northeast Tennessee." <laughs> It is a major problem. It is the second leading cause of death. It is worse here than in the nation as a whole. It is a major problem, but it doesn't really explain the disparity uh, that we have. But anyway, 10 years ago, this is where this talk would have stopped. You would have had plenty of time for, for a break. Regretfully, we've got new information. And we go beyond this now, particularly to talk about our understanding of these social circumstances. 
And this really will be illustrative for this region. In fact, some folks are now saying that, that this probably should be greater than 15% because many of the behavioral factors are, in fact, tied to social circumstance. We know that someone who's poor is, much more, is more likely to smoke, more likely to be obese, more likely to have a sedentary lifestyle, and so on. So this is all built on this concept that our health is, starts with our genetics, what we inherit access to health care and other resources, our behaviors, but then also the realization that there are a variety of social factors that impact our health. And when you look at this list, everything up there will make sense to you. You can look at that and say, yeah, it makes sense that someone, you know, someone who's living in a dangerous area is going to have less health, poorer health than someone else. But you may not appreciate how incredibly strong these relationships are. So I'm just going to take two of these and show you what, show you some data. First is income. If I ask you to think about income on a global level, right, you think about the poorest countries in the world and the least healthy countries in the world, chances are you'd have the same countries on your list, right? We understand that income is tied to health. This is a chart from 2004 from Hans Rosling, Karolinski Institute. What he's done is he's taken all the countries in the world and each dot represents a country. The size of the dot is the population of the country. So there's India. I'm having a little trouble with this pointer. I'm Fortunately, I have my own pointer. I'll see if it works any better. Yeah, so there, there's China, there's India, there's the United States. All the countries in the world, the color has to do with the continent. This is wealth here with wealthy countries over here, poor countries over here. This is health. Now, in this case, it's under five mortality, the chance of a baby dying before their fifth birthday. Okay, it's another measure of health. Um, and in 2004, the poorest country in the world was Sierra Leone, which had just come out of a civil war. The under five mortality at the time was 300. That means for every thousand babies born alive, 300 were not going to reach their fifth birthday. At the same time, the healthiest country in the world was Sweden, with an under five mortality just over three. So a hundredfold difference in this measure of health defined by an economic metric. Now that's entirely consistent with most of our world views. We tend to understand that. What many people don't understand is that that same relationship exists within our country. This is a chart that shows how with the chance of dying before the age of 65 based on income. So wealthy Americans here, poor Americans there. What this shows is that poor Americans have about a three-fold greater chance of dying before the age of 65 as wealthy Americans. Think about that for a second. Three times the chance of dying before the age of 65 if you're in the poorest income group. And again, it's this remarkable, almost linear relationship between poverty and health. This matters to us in this reg region for two reasons. It matters, first of all, because we have higher rates of poverty here. If you look at the chart for all counties in America, for children living in poverty, again, you can see an almost three-fold difference, which again is pretty phenomenal if you think about it. Take all the counties of Northeast Tennessee, add them to the list, Southwest Virginia, 95% of our counties place us in the bottom half over a third fall into the bottom quarter, and we are basically poor. So clearly poverty should matter to us in this region because we have higher rates of poverty here than elsewhere. The second reason poverty matters to us, besides it being tied uh, to health, is that the gap between rich and poor in our country is actually widening. Okay, and I can show you that. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, but it takes Americans by fifths. So there's the poorest 20% of Americans. Here's the richest 20%. Percent. 1971, 1981, 1991, 2001, 2011. That makes sense to folks? What this says, and this is in constant dollars, what this says is that from 1971 to 2011, 40 years, the actual income of the poorest fifth of Americans went up by about 8.5%. During that same time period, the richest fifth went up by about 51%. So the ratio between the two increased 39%, a widening gap between rich and poor in our country. Now, I'm not talking here about the extremely rich. 
This is the 20th percentile. One of every five of you is in the top five for wealth in this room. Perhaps a bit more than that nationally, okay? But if you look not at the top fifth, but the top 5%, you see the gaps getting even wider. And if you look at the 1% and so on, it gets wider still. Now, I don't put this up to make a political comment because I'm not a political guy. I put it up to make a very important public health comment. And that is this. If you believe that income is tied to health, as I do, you begin to realize that if we don't have economic growth and development in this region, we're going to see widening gaps in health and not narrowing gaps. As the economic gap widens, if we don't focus on economic development, job creation in this region, we're going to see widening gap and not narrowing gap. And that's why this matters to us. The only other one I want to show you is education, just because it's the, it's the business I'm in, but also because the relationship is, is, so, is so strong. So this is a chart that shows the rel how much longer you're going to live at age 25 based on your education. So this is men, this is women. If you have less than a high school education there, by age 25, the difference for men is almost seven years compared to a college graduate, and women, it's almost five years. All right? Education is tied to health outcome. Now, this matters to us in this region, region for two reasons. The first is we have lower rates of educational achievement in our region. If you look at all the counties in America, you see this, this is for some college, this almost doubling difference, it's quite remarkable. In this case, it's better to be at the high, on the right side, all my other slides were the other way around. This is the one time we're having a high number is better, all right? Unfortunately, our region falls near the bottom. So three quarters of our counties fall in the bottom half of America. 42% fall in the bottom, a couple in the bottom 10%, and virtually all of them are below the Tennessee average. The second reason this matters for us is that there is data to suggest that the gap is also widening in educational achievement between those with educational achievement and those without it. This is a somewhat complicated slide, but basically it asks a simple question, and that is how many kids who are high school sophomores today will have a college degree in 10 years. How many kids will take a seven year, in, in a 10 year period will complete a seven year journey from high school sophomore to college graduate? What this shows us is if their parents are professionals, 73% of them are going to complete that journey. If their parents are high school dropouts, less than a 12th. Again, this phenomenal linear relationship. And what does this mean? This means that areas of the countries with lower rates of educational achievement are going to see the next generation have a lower rate and a widening gap. So if we want to improve health in this region, we have to also make sure that we improve educational outcome. We've got to get more kids through school, more kids through high school, more kids through college, because education is tied with health. And if we don't address this, we're going to see a widening gap in educational accomplishment and a concomitant widening gap in health outcomes. So I could go on and talk about more of this slide, but I think the basic message is out there. If I was going to put it all into a single slide, this is what it would look like. If we want to improve health in our region, we do have to have access to health care, no question about it. We have to work on that. That's still a problem for us. We also have to address behaviors, particularly those leading causes of death. But we also have to work on jobs and education. And the key point here is that these things are inexorably intertwined, OK? You can't do one without the other. If you take home one message from what I'm saying today, take home this message. Every employer will tell you what they need is a healthy, educated, drug-free workforce. Every school superintendent will tell you what they need are kids that are parents that are healthy, but also an economic base to support the school system. Every one of you know that what you need is patients that are educated to make good decisions, but who also have the resources to invest in their health. The key message here is that these are inexorably linked. If we want to improve any one of these, we have to improve all three. Okay? If we put it into words, it looks like this. What do we have to do to improve health in the United States or in our region, in central Appalachia or in Wisconsin or Washington, D.C. or Georgia? We have to work together to assure access to health care, especially preventive services. We need to work together to encourage healthier behaviors, and we need to work together 
to enhance economic opportunity and improve educational outcome. It's obvious what these three have in common, and that is we have to work together. These are not problems that Washington, D.C. or Nashville can solve for us. These are not problems that Johnson City or Kingsport can solve independently. These are not problems for doctors or educators, uh, economic development folks to solve alone. These are not problems for Republicans or Democrats or libertarians or social anarchists or anyone else to solve alone. If we're going to solve these problems, we have to solve them together. Now, when I say this, people typically have one of two reactions. First, they say, well, that's good stuff, Dr. Wyckoff. I enjoyed your talk, nice slides, good use of PowerPoint. But, you know, th this business about linking with economic development and educational opportunity really isn't my job, right? I'm an internist, or I'm an administrator. I conduct research, I'm a dean of public health, or every one of them. But if you think about it, what do we all have in common? Everyone who works in healthcare is involved with trying to help this community be as healthy as it can be. We're trying to give our children and our grandchildren a region that is healthier. This is inexorably all of our jobs. So the second challenge is perhaps more reasonable, which is, well, you know, that's good stuff, but man, trying to change the health of the people of the United States is just too big a challenge especially in this region, because we're worse here than, than Tennessee, which is worse in the nation, which is 33rd in the world. Well, it is. It's a big challenge. But you remember early on I, I showed you this slide. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to one of the people on that slide. This guy was uh, born in the 1850s. Um, went, to medical, oh, went to college at Virginia Military Institute. He went to UVA as a physician, joined the army, went out and fought in the Indian Wars, came back and became the city health officer in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I'm interested in this guy because I have in my office a book called the Virginia Health Bulletin from 100 years ago that shows the leading causes of death that he was dealing with 100 years ago. All right? Tuberculosis, cancer, whooping cough, typhoid. Remember, 100 years ago there were no antibiotics. There were only two vaccines in the world, and they weren't for any of these diseases. There were no magic bullets. This guy could easily have thrown up his arms and said, there's nothing we can do. This is too big a challenge. But this guy and a bunch of other healthcare professionals of all sorts and types did something really phenomenal. They improved life expectancy in this country by decades. If you look at this, most of the advance in health in our country came in the first half of the last century, before most of our modern medical conveniences and advances took place. They knew a hundred years ago something that we need to learn today. Now this guy is not famous, right? There's nothing named for him as far as I know. I'm interested in him because he was my great-grandfather. And I wondered what would it be like to be a healthcare professional at a time when the challenges seemed unsolvable. Well, there's another picture in the Virginia Health Bulletin that I think says more about health than any lecture I could give you today. A hundred years ago, this was the picture. On one side of the wall were the leading causes of death, diphtheria, scarlet fever, and measles. On the other side were the rather oddly dressed children of that time. And the question was, how high is the wall in your town? They knew a hundred years ago, education, good health care, good public health, they knew a hundred years ago that they could protect their kids, and they did it. Now today our leading causes of death have changed, right? Heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and unintentional injury. But we can be just as optimistic that we need to build a wall today. Maybe now we'll focus more on prevention, access to affordable health care, improvements in education and economic development. But I think we can be just as optimistic if we focus on those things, we can help our children make the kind of advances that they made over 100 years ago. Building a wall like this will impact everywhere in this country, every state in the nation, but probably nowhere more than our region. You've met my great-grandfather, that's my son Kevin, my son Gregory, my daughters Kathleen and Andrea, my wife and I, and I end with this slide to make the point that nothing I've talked about has anything to do with statistics or anything to do with politics. 
It has to do with whether or not we as leaders of this community will make the kind of decisions that we need to make to give our children a region that is as healthy as it is beautiful. We know it can be done. You guys are the ones to do it. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you.